time and welcome to our show again. Today we have a wonderful guest uh, who's here in Singapore, but he's Singaporean. Uh, his name is uh, Nadir uh, Safar and he is the president of the Singapore Business Council for UAE. And the vision of the Singapore Business Council uh, UAE is the focal point for Singapore entities and individuals seeking opportunities with other entities in the Gulf. Uh, and is also assisting the, the positioning of Singapore as, uh, as a base for foreign businesses to expand into and in partnership with Singapore entities and individuals. Uh, Mr. Nadia, welcome to our show again. Mm, and, thank you. Uh, you know, it is amazing how uh, UAE is now uh, emerging uh, and opening up its market uh, you know, for business. Um, tell us, though, what's the what's the main uh, focal point and you know and the uh, vision for UAE as the president? <clears throat> well, um, I'm working uh, as a public service to the Singapore uh, community as the president of the Singapore Business Council, what we do is we represent the interests of the Singaporean professionals and companies in the UAE. The SBC is uh, registered with the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry, under which we um, um, you know, conduct our activities. Uh, the primary aim of the organization um, is to organize networking opportunities for members to get to know others um, in the same industries or same businesses um, with the ultimate objective of facilitating business, uh, making business happen. Uh, we've been very successful in our goals so far. We've been around for more than 12 years. The SBC is registered in the Dubai Chamber but it operates under the patronage of the Singapore Consulate in Dubai. And We've had many events, I think uh, on average one a month. Most recently we had an event which brought together four of the top bankers in the UAE uh, to discuss the economic outlook of the UAE uh, over the next three years. And it was notable that the four speakers that we brought together were all Singaporeans. Um, it's rather interesting that the top, some of the top bankers in the UAE happen to be Singaporean. Wow. Now, what's the, what's the outlook then, the, the, your perception in UAE today for the next three years? I think it looks very bright. And I'm not saying this because I, I live there. Um, I came to the UAE three years ago, in August 2009. At that time, it was, there was no traffic. It was rather, um, the streets were rather empty relative to where it is today. Uh, hotel prices were much lower. The price, rental prices um, were very low and very depressed compared to where they were a year before I arrived. In fact, um, when I arrived, I was told that the rental prices were up to 40% lower than they were in January of that same year. And I came in August. Since then, three years late before and now, I've seen that the traffic on the streets has actually increased many fold. The property prices are actually going up. Hotels are getting occupied. Um, the hotel prices are also rising a lot. I mean, these are small indicators that the economy is on a rise. Uh, it's definitely a sign that things are going well. And I expect that this will continue while most of the world was hit by the recession, the UAE as a country, uh, of which Dubai is just one city, the UAE actually was very resilient to this crisis because of the strength of Abu Dhabi, which is uh, the capital of the UAE. Now, what's the secret behind the, uh, the success for UAE? Despite of the global recession, how were they able to sustain themselves? I believe the UAE, um, of course, the oil is a big factor in, the, in their wealth. Abu Dhabi has one of the largest reserves of oil um, in the world. But apart from the oil, they've also diversified the economy into many other areas, some of which has been good and some of which has not been so good. Of course, during the crisis, the areas that were impacted the most were the property market, the financial market, but they also have other areas in the UAE which bring in a lot of revenue apart from the oil. There's the tourism, there are the ports, 
uh, it's a huge trading hub in the region. So the diversification, I mean, the, the economy was helped by the different uh, areas in which it was um, diversified into. Amazing. Now, what kind of infrastructure uh, growth do you see in UAE for the next five years? Uh, is the government in UAE interested to actually invite more investors to, to come in, or is it still a, a, a very reserved and closed society? I think it's a very open society. If you look at the UAE compared to any other Arab country, this is the country that has been built on a vision, a vision of the rule of the UAE, um, who thought of taking, turning around what was once a desert into one of the most modern and progressive societies in the Middle East. Really? Dubai and Abu Dhabi as well may seem to some foreigners a bit um, excessive in their um, compliance to certain Islamic laws. For example, we always hear in the media about how some British couple were kicked out for kissing in public. But what the people don't realize is that when you look at the UAE compared to the rest of the Middle East, it's actually one of the most liberal countries in the Middle East. If you compare to Saudi Arabia, if you compare to Iran, the UAE actually has a rather progressive society. And I think it's the vision that they've had which has helped them become such a huge power. They want to become the best in everything they do. And they're now competing with Singapore on many fronts. Really? They're wow. competing with Singapore in the aviation sector. They're competing with Singapore in the shipping sector. Uh, they're very, very strong contenders in the duty-free market as well. Um, in some areas, they might have even overtaken Singapore. They're more tourists. Really? Wow. And now, what kind of changes? Could you give us some examples in terms of uh, doing business in UAE with foreigners and foreign companies? Uh, how how liberalized is the country itself when it comes to culture? Uh, you know, uh, are they open for, for more cultural exchanges? Uh, you know, such as music, uh, art, you know, and archaeology, of course. And, of, and apart from that goal, there's a lot of talk about goal in UAE, although it may not be your expertise, but do they actually have goal reserves in UAE? Mm, goal? Yes, I think there would be some reserves in the UAE, but um, I'm not too familiar with how much... Yes, but they're not selling it. Yeah, but to go back to your earlier question on the cultural understanding, the UAE is certainly very, very open to you know, getting to know more about the world and for people to get to know more about the Arab world and the UAE in particular. And they're doing this through a number of very constructive um, initiatives, one of which is the Center for Cultural Understanding, which has been set up primarily to bridge the gap between the West and the East. Uh, second thing they've got is this uh, group called Project Encounter, where every year about 50 youth leaders from the Western world come to the UAE and get to understand the local culture, get to meet with the local people. Sometimes they even get invited to meet the sheikh himself, the ruler. Um, I think these are some initiatives which are going a long way in bridging the gap. I believe there's a lot more that can be done. A lot of expats, they come to the UAE and they don't actually get to know or meet anyone who is a local. Uh, that's rather unfortunate, but the things are changing. Uh, one of the reasons why they haven't been able to meet as many locals is because, firstly, there are not many. It's about 10% in Dubai. 10% uh, of the population in Dubai are actually locals. Uh, number two is because of the nature of their jobs. Um, unless you're in the government sector in Dubai, it's harder to meet with Emiratis on a daily basis. Now, what is leadership to the U UAE? What does innovation and leadership mean to them? Innovation now is a huge thing in the UAE. Um, the reason being that the crisis has actually been um, instrumental in making them think about getting more diversified. Reinvention. Reinvention, exactly. I think it's been the catalyst, so to speak, of future um, expansion areas. They're looking at all sorts of means now to imprint their footprint in the global scene. Um, what exactly are they doing? Well, there's a number of things that they are doing. And that is, of course, to consolidate their strengths. Their strengths in shipping and tourism and uh, the aviation sector. These are things they're consolidating, but they're also looking outside. For example, they're building up on their green energy 
um, capabilities. I believe in Abu Dhabi they're building an entire city that's a green city, which is something very unique, um, which probably is not going to be done in many places in the world. Well, now speaking about green cities, uh, innovation, and, and so forth, who's actually responsible and actually spearheading uh, uh, UAE? Uh, all these initiatives and investment. Is it actually the Emir the, the or is it the, the council? I believe it's all of them. Well, it's not the Emir, it's the Sheikh. Oh, Sheikh, okay. Um, and his group of advisors. And uh, there's the overall president of the UAE. And then there's a prime minister of the UAE. Um, and then there's a whole council of them. And they consist of people comprised of leaders from all the various emirates in the UAE. There's Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Ras Al Khaimah, there's, you know, Fujairah, there's a whole bunch of them. And uh, it's this group of people who are changing things. We all know about Abu Dhabi and Dubai. We don't know much about Ras Al Khaimah, which is a very up and coming emirate. In fact, it's, it even holds in this uh, emirate uh, one of the strongest Singapore brands there is, the Banyan Tree. The Banyan Tree, this global resort, is actually present in Ras Al Khaimah. And it's one of the top hotels in the UAE. Well, now, speaking about being the, well, the top and the best in, in, in the world, or probably as well as in the Middle East for UAE, um, what sort of advice would you give for businesses you know, in Asia and elsewhere? Well, one thing to do business with UAE for the very first time, probably the very first uh, Middle Eastern country that they, they're going to do business with. Is there any conformity or, or mannerism uh, and cultural awareness that they should know, uh, the way they should greet, the way they should approach for the first time when they want to make friends with a on a B2B basis? Um, should they be lavish with their gifts? Because I've heard stories that you have to give a very expensive and exorbitant gifts to to your neighbors in the Middle East. Is that true? About giving the expensive gifts, I, to be honest, don't think it's necessarily true. Um, there is a certain amount of etiquette that is required in any business transaction anywhere in the world. And it's, it's common sense, really. I think wherever, in every country you go to, respect the laws of the land. Um, get to know a bit about the culture. Like, for example, in the US, it's a very, um, I would say, it's a very different dynamic than it would be in the Arab world. In the Arab world, you'll be greeted by hospitality, you'll be greeted by people who want to get to know you as a person before they want to do business with you. Whereas in the US, there's a slightly different view taken where they want to do the business and get to know you probably later. So that's one, one example. Now, as for advice for Singapore companies who want to do business in the UAE, I would advise them to contact the Singapore Business Council because that's what we do. We help facilitate these companies who are in Singapore come to the Middle East using Dubai as their launch pad. And we can do this through our very strong contacts. We are connected with the Singapore Consulate, the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry, through all the relevant other business councils, the American Business Council, the British Business Council, Canadian, and so on. Uh, so we have a very, very strong network of professionals and companies whom we can then utilize and leverage upon to help our Singapore counterparts when they want to um, go to the Middle East. Now, how fast can a business be able to set up in UAE, unlike in Singapore? Well, Singapore is really fast. I think Singapore is voted the fastest place in the world to do business, uh, to start a business. In the UAE, it's a little bit more um, long. It's a longer process. Um, and how long is long? <laughs> It depends. It could take up to many months. Really? It could take a few weeks. It all depends on the strength of your business that you're bringing, on the strength of your partners, on the um, on the ideas that you have to do business. I mean, they're very um, careful about the kind of businesses that operate in the UAE. Really? I'm not not to say that Singapore isn't. Singapore is. It's just that they make it easier for people to set up a business. Whereas in the UAE. I think they've been bitten before by cases of businesses coming in and 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 leaving, um, you know, in, in, in weird circumstances. I understand. So, last but not least, though, uh, moving forward, what do you see UAE, as well as your organization, the Singapore Business Council of UAE, uh, for the next 
coming five years, despite of the doom and gloom over the world economic crisis, and despite uh, the currency issues in you know in, in the European Union as well as the U.S., what do you see in UAD that appeals to you so much, and that you are confident that you will continue to thrive? Well, there's a couple of things about the UAE that I really like, and I think. Um, uh, one of these primarily is the fact that the cost of living in the UAE compared to Singapore is far lower. Really? Far lower, which is a rather uh, surprising thing. Uh, I can throw a few examples, like car prices in the UAE. Uh, you could buy a, a Porsche, for example, brand new, for maybe 90,000 Singapore dollars. Really? 90,000 dollars for a Porsche? That's the UAE. Wow. Petrol is maybe 70 cents per liter. Goodness gracious. Folks, are you hearing this? Okay, <laughs> buy a Porsche in UAE, and, but don't try to bring it back to the United States. <laughs> Housing in the UAE, um, because of the crisis that took place three years ago, it knocked the wind out of the rising property prices. Really? And the prices now are still very, very much bargain, bargain prices. For example, I'll cite another example. You could stay in a one-bedroom, five-star hotel, service department, for about 2,500 Singapore dollars a month. Really? Wow. That's incredible. I mean, it's not a price you can see in Singapore. But then again, having said that, you were asking what it would be like in five years. These prices will not hold in five years. As the UAE becomes a lot more stronger, as a lot more people move to the UAE because of its thriving and prospering, uh, prosperous um, economy, you'll see that prices will be going up, demand will be going up, and you know the benefits that I'm enjoying today may not be there five years from now. Having said that, I think the, the pay in the UAE is always rising. Oh. And perhaps the pay will catch up with the inflation. inflation. So what sort of investment uh, did you, uh, you know, get yourself involved with? I mean, sorry. But uh, mm -hmm. do you have any investments in UAE or do you think uh, other investors around the world uh, should, well, in this case, uh, seek uh, an interest to invest in UAE, such as gold and property and so forth. Is it a good thing to do it right now? Absolutely. I think right now, if you're interested, if you have the money, I say go into property. Because property prices in the UAE are almost, almost at the basement. They're rising. Yep. They were at the basement last year. And it was really, uh, compared to Singapore prices, of course, extremely low. Yeah. Uh, and how much is it, is, let's say, a condominium, say, about uh, probably a 5,000 square feet condominium would cost in <laughs> UAE? Well, 5,000 square feet, a like, condominium is a rather large one. Yeah. And uh, I actually haven't seen any 5,000 square feet condominiums on sale. Okay. Um, but well, I, what's the biggest you've seen so far? I've seen a 5,000 square foot um, house. House. Okay. And how much are they? Bungalow. Room? That whole entire place would cost you probably in the in the range of about two million Sing dollars. That's in Singapore. I uh, know that's in the UAE. Oh, UAE, two million dollars. Two million Sing dollars for let's say a five thousand square foot huge uh, bungalow, double story, big garden, swimming pool. Yeah, and how about how in a in a prime location? Oh, okay. And how about maybe say nine hundred square feet or or less? How much would that go for? Two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars. For now. That's right, for a very state-of-the-art modern apartment wow. in a great neighborhood. Well, thanks for your advice. And, and uh, folks, thank you for joining us here at the National Great Choice